Welcome back, colleagues. Thank you very much for returning so promptly. I must say, um, the cup of tea I had was one of the best I've had in a major institution for some time. Uh, I hope yours was as good as mine. Um, we're going to have a video now, uh, and then I'll uh, introduce the Teaching Excellence uh, panel. I think a lot of, sort of confidence and sort of personality, in a way, does play into it, because it's all well and good if you have the knowledge, but at the end of the day, you need to effectively communicate it mm -hmm. to the students so they do learn. Like, you do notice when you're sat in a lecture, if someone's just sat there going, and this line is whatever, versus where someone's like, guys, look at this amazing research. It's, it needs to be engaging, doesn't it? I think good teaching means that the tutors really look after you and make sure that you're on track and know what you're doing. Like, we get feedback all the time. I, I, I enjoy it when the teacher comes over and comes one-to-one -one and will sit down to my level and help me individually, you see. Professors who care a lot about, like, making sure that you understand the content and are comfortable with the material. I like, think almost like a passion in it. Yeah, that yeah. You can tell that somebody's doing this because it's not only their, their job, but they also love the subject that they're talking about. I think someone who shows an actual passion for, for you succeeding and to see you do well, going the extra mile. And we've got several tutors here who have got high passion for what they do and to provide so much knowledge of their industry um, experience, which then we can learn from. And then obviously there's also the academic side of it as well, which is okay <laughs> but obviously the, the stuff that's more experience based is a, is a lot more beneficial to us when tutors know what they're talking about they have knowledge in their area they're active in sort of research and are able to pass that knowledge on to you and support you in your learning yeah i feel like some care a lot more than others to be fair like like some some they just turn up to lectures do the lecture and that's it whereas you get others like, like giving you questions like asking questions in the lectures and stuff like that just a lot more involved and ones that realise that obviously you do have a life outside of uni as well, so they understand if you've got like family problems or work or anything like that, and they always work along with you as well, not against you as well. Um, I must say thanks to whoever produced these wonderful videos all through the day. Um, this panel is about teaching excellence. Uh, everybody in the room is familiar with this as a, as a priority. Uh, we're building on work that's been done by Hefty, and this is actually an opportunity uh, in between the uh, access and, and success and progression panel, and this one for me to uh, thank Hefty and Offer for their collaboration during this period of creating the OFS, and particularly to thank uh, Les Ebden and uh, Madeleine Atkins uh, and obviously all their colleagues for the collaboration in helping us uh, get to this launch. Um, right now, I want to in introduce uh, Yvonne, who is... Uh, leading this panel on teaching excellence. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Yvonne's uh, vital contribution at Hefke over the last uh, recent years. Uh, we're delighted that uh, Yvonne will continue to contribute to higher education uh, through the work of the OFS in the future. Uh, and Yvonne will introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, before I introduce the panel, I just want to give a quick warning to ask um, students and student representatives in the audience to, you probably haven't put them down, but to pick up your phones because I'm about to ask you a couple of questions in response to the video. Um, and whilst you're finding your phones, let, let me introduce our, our panel. So we have Professor Janice Kay, Deputy Chair of the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework and also leading on the subject pilots um, that you'll be familiar with. Um, Professor Jackie Labbe from uh, De Montfort University. Uh, who's going to talk to us about how that university uh, engaged and collaborated with its students on this important agenda. And continuing that theme of student voice and student engagement, we have Lauren Marks, who is a TEF student panel member. So hopefully now you've got your phones in your hand. Um, not everybody, if you're a student or a student representative, I've got two quick questions for you. And the first is, from that quick video, do you recognise that description of good teaching? Pregnant pause, sorry, won't be a moment. Okay, that's brilliant. In that, I think what I'm playing back, what I've seen and what I hope you're recognising is that what really matters to students, therefore, is 
is that their engagement with their teaching is with passionate teaching staff, knowledgeable teaching staff, people who were engaged with you as students, who will communicate well with you, who care about you as individuals, who understand the outcomes that you're aspiring to achieve, and who'll go the extra mile to work with you to try and support you in achieving those outcomes. So that's all really positive. Next question and final question in terms of this interactive activity here. Killer question for the students and their representatives. So given that that's one descriptor of good teaching, do you experience good teaching? And while the students and their reps in the room are, are answering that, um, just to say, at the end of the panel session, um, we'll take questions, and you can generate those questions throughout this session um, by using the app as before. Okay, we have an answer here. So 72% of students and their representatives in the room say they do experience good teaching. 28% no. A mixed bag and a bag which I think demonstrates that there's more work to be done. And it's been said already, and, and lots of times this today, but I'm not going to apologize for saying it one more time, that this matters, getting this right matters, because students invest an enormous amount of time, energy, sheer hard work, and not least, let's forget, money in their higher education. And they should expect high quality re teaching in return. So this session, through the lens of the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework, is going to explore how universities and colleges, by engaging with their students in partnership, can work together to ensure that there is that high quality academic experience. And from the Office for Students perspective, that matters. It matters for a number of reasons. It matters because the outcomes of that ex exercise will inform prospective student choice. It matters because we want to drive excellence in this important agenda. We want to recognize it and we want to celebrate it. And vitally, we want to ensure that through exercises such as this at the TEF, we can try and ensure that all students from all backgrounds really achieve positive outcomes, whether that's for one individual progressing to graduate in employment or another progressing to further study. So, as I say, now we're going to turn to actually the, the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework itself, explore its challenges and opportunities, and then pick up the theme of universities and colleges engaging with students in that endeavour. So, Janice. Thanks, Mom. If you're a woman, you don't have a pocket, so <laughs> apologies for that clunkiness. Does that mean I'm not a woman then? <laughs> I do have a pocket. Um, hi, everyone. It's really good, actually, to see that so many of the people who responded to this feel that they did experience good quality teaching, but a quarter of you didn't feel you did. And this is actually what this session and what universities and colleges and other providers are all about, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So I looked at the film I took really a snapshot of what the students were saying and, and what struck me was the number of times that passionate and passionate were said there. These are students who are investing heavily in their education and they really need to feel that the staff, staff who are dealing with them, helping them to learn because after all it isn't just teaching excellence, is it? It's how to facilitate excellence in learning. That those staff are really passionate and are there for them. But if you listen to what they were saying, did, it, did that in any sense summate to the concept of excellent teaching? I think the answer to your four, first question suggested that no, it didn't quite. But a lot of the things that those students were saying are the ingredients of what we think is excellent teaching. And that's actually what the TEF is designed to do. So it assesses institutions on three aspects of quality, teaching quality, the learning environment, and student outcomes and learning gain. And across those three aspects are 10 domains, 
and you can see them here in brackets. And the kinds of domains that have been identified are the kinds of things that those students were talking about. The idea that someone is passionate about their teaching. Guys, look at this amazing research and not mumbling into the PowerPoint. Those kinds of things are encapsulated in the valuing teaching. The feedback, the personalized learning, the being passionate about the experience of industry and industry relationships around employability and transferable skills. So I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this, but others will not be. So I would just take you through very briefly what the Teaching Excellence Framework is all about. So there are a series of metrics which are core, which are looking across those different aspects of quality. They are measurable, some of them are very well rehearsed, the National Student Survey, the Delhi statistics. And those six core metrics are split down across those, exactly those groups for whom we want to accelerate participation in education. And those metrics are benchmarks, so one can look at the relevant, the relative performance of a particular institution against other institutions that are similar, for example, in the subject mix, in the attainment in stu of students, in the demographics. And this year, in the second substantive round of the Teaching Excellence Framework, we're also looking at absolute performance, which is looking at, across each of these metrics, the top and the bottom deciles uh, by provider. And this year also, we are looking at grade inflation. We're looking at longitudinal uh, employment outcomes, that is sustained employment and salaries, and teaching intensity. So we heard earlier about the importance from, from Jim around uh, uh, contact hours. We're looking at that in terms of teaching intensity. So there is a sort of, in a sense, a metrics profile across institutions. But as well as that, there is a written submission, 15 pages up to. This is where actually institutions can look very seriously about what they are trying to do, what the mission is for their students, and actually working with their students in many, many cases in producing that submission. And that's actually where you can see examples of innovation, and even as Michael was saying at the beginning of the day, some elements of beauty. So these, these, in a sense, overall aggregate assessments of institutions are summarized in a series of ratings, gold, silver, bronze, provisional, and a brief statement of findings, which attempts to synthesize why the, uh, 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 why the institution was given the uh, rating it was. And I'll come back to that again. So, does TEF, does the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework equate with teaching excellence? There are as many definitions of teaching excellence as there are at least people in this room and beyond. TEF is not a direct measure of teaching, but it is, as Chris Husbands has said, a measure of some of the outcomes of teaching. And indeed, one can see the evolution of our ability and our wish across providers to evaluate teaching for 30 years or so. So I am old enough to remember subject review. And then we moved into institutional review, institutional audit, higher education review. But now for the first time, we actually can look at all institutions, all institutions who choose to participate together. And TEF will continue to evolve. It's carefully evaluated. We're moving into subject level TEF, and I'll say something about that. We're going to have an independent review, uh, and there is genuinely an appetite for improvement. So what did we learn about uh, the Teaching Excellence Framework as it was done last year? I think we learned that the process does cast light on the interrelationships within institutions 
between their strategy, their practice, their outcomes for students and student satisfaction. It had an integral widening partic participation focus. And I think in the, as we move into TEF 3 and the subject level pilot, we're thinking more carefully about how to use those experts in widening participation. And I think we were, I think there is room to say that UUK and the Department for Education Reviews did find confidence in a fair process. It highlighted some outstanding work, marginalised groups and further education colleges, for example. And I believe it is my contention that last year's TEF and TEF as it goes forward provides very good evidence that engagement works. So if you look across and all the written submissions are published, the very best accounts were those where student engagement were deeply embedded at all, all levels of the university. And the Exeter, our slice and dice of the written submissions, found that a majority of the gold higher education institution statements referred to engagement of students as being fundamental to their approach. But there are no shortcuts to this. We all use the lip service of student engagement very often, but that has to be as far as you can push it within your disciplines. And we talked within your institutions, and we talked a little bit today about what that meant in terms of, uh, of fee spend. Um, but actually throughout the organization, throughout the process of teaching and beyond. So opportunities and challenges of TEF, I'm just going to say a few things about this. You can see the listings here that I, I think are the opportunities of TEF around identifying and promoting innovation, but there are also challenges too. And the one biggest challenge for me I, I can identify is that it is only if the data that we produce through the teaching excellence framework can be used by students and prospective students to promote choice, will it become most effective? And that gives us a massive communication challenge, and that's something that is, a, in a sense, a direct challenge for uh, what the Office for Students does in interacting with us all. Now, we've all been talking about this slide, actually. This is the happy slide 2017, and here it is. This is students' perceptions of value for money for their courses. And you can see from 53%, in a sense, the high spot of this graph in 2017, those who feel that value for money is good or very good equates with those who feel it's poor and very poor. And we have to think about that as institutions and what that means for us. One of the responses is actually to look at the, the future of the TEF itself. And these are a couple of slides that I stole with pride from my hefty colleagues. This is the, uh, what is going to happen as we move into subject level. And the point about um, subject level, one of the principal points, is better to inform students about their subjects. So the scope of the subject level pilot is exploratory. It is evaluative. And the very good thing about it, I believe, is that it is evaluation by, um, in a sense, peers, students, employers, widening participation experts, and the institutions who've chosen to participate in the pilots themselves. At the moment, it's 50 uh, institutions who are participating. And we have 137 panelists, and of those, 37 are students. And of the seven subject groups, students are the deputy chairs of those panels. So we are evaluating two models. Um, we are take, going through a full process, and we will treat it as if it is a full exercise. But the outcomes will remain um, confidential as we move into the second round of piloting next year. So in summary, a couple of slides before I finish. TEF assesses subjects as we move forward on aspects of quality across metrics which are benchmarked, plus giving absolute data 
on performance with a written submission and rated. But the most important task, I believe, is to be able to communicate for choice the findings um, to allow students not only to choose but also to judge value for money. So finally, the future of teaching excellence. It is not easy. Measuring this will evolve. There are a number of ways of doing that. Communication is really key. We don't know about the international impact. I, and I believe that I'm no different from my colleagues who are involved in this process, being asked by Australian universities, Hong Kong, Singapore, about the teaching excellence framework because they believe that they can learn and that uh, their governments may introduce it. But we're not actually sure at the moment what the impact on international students is. And they, that may be positive or far less positive, we need to know. But finally, and the last thing I want to say is that um, I believe that the future of teaching excellence or rather learning excellence lies in student engagement, in student participation, in a really deep understanding of how we can work with students in terms of driving forward quality and standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a neat segue into our next speaker, Jeffrey, who's going to pick up on that very point. Doing the same thing. <laughs> Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was asked to say a few words about how De Montfort University engaged with our students in the, the TEF2 process, and I am indeed going to do that. But before I do, I'd like to say just a little bit about DMU itself so you can kind of see where we were coming from. So De Montfort has about 22,000 students based in Leicester. Of that student body, about 10% are overseas, so the rest home EU. Um, about 90% of our student body is undergraduate. Um, we've got um, a huge preponderance of local and regional students, so we're very much serving our region. Um, and I think what's really quite um, distinctive about us, um, around about 16% of our student body is registered disabled, and uh, at this stage, more than 50% of our student body is also BAME. So we've got quite a diverse student body, um, even though it's mainly undergraduate. And because of that, they come to us with quite a diverse set of needs and requirements. Um, their backgrounds are, are, again, very diverse. Their prior attainment um, is also very diverse, and also their level of preparedness. Um, we get students coming to us with uh, A-level um, results, ranging really anything from, from Bs to Ds. And, of course, what that gives you is such a mixed cohort that in terms of their readiness, their preparedness, we can't rely on any one base level of readiness, and we have to approach our students as individuals rather than as a, a cohesive group. Um, and that, I think, really informs our understanding of what it means to work with our students anyway. Now, over the last few years, we've seen quite a bit of rapid growth in our undergraduate student body. Our year one intake, for instance, has grown by around about 35%. So we're also seeing a bigger campus than we had um, for many, many years. And that brings with it, again, an awful lot of challenges um, about, well, how do you teach more students than you might have been used to in the past? How do you amend your pedagogy and your, your classroom practice so that those students do get the teaching that they are entitled to receive and that they have the chance to feed in as well? As I said, they come to us with a variety of mindsets. So I, I've taught in several universities uh, in this country, and, and what I've noticed is that that level of prior attainment does really, in a way, um, set students on a pathway, but at different points. So if you make sort of comparisons, if you've got students coming to your university who are already coming with, um, you might say, a huge basket of achievements, so they've already done very well, you know, they've already achieved great A-levels, they've already racked up a whole level of accomplishments. Um, and then you contrast that, I think, with a group of students who have come to university possibly feeling, you know, should I really be here? The first in their family to come to university, commuting in from a distance, not with the, the level of social capital or support um, at home or, or really within their community. And it's this diversity that I think that really gives us that set of contrast that Sir Michael Barber was talking about earlier. We need this kind of diverse sector, in other words, in order to be able to, to serve our student pop, uh, population um, as well as we possibly can. Now, at De Montfort, 
teaching is definitely our mission and it's our focus. Um, we have quite a bit of good research that goes on, but we are a teaching intensive institution. Um, and uh, what I can say with huge confidence is at the point when the, the TEF2 results came out, what I noticed, I was new to the institution at that point, a huge sense of community pride at that result. Um, the, the announcement of, of the gold was felt by everybody at the university as a real validation of what they did and what they put in to their activities. And, and I thought that that was really great because a lot went into the submission itself and everybody seemed to join in the celebration of the outcome. But as teaching is our mission and our focus, um, we have got both curricular and co-curricular developments that draws on preparing our students for life. So we want to prepare them to succeed in their degrees, but we also want to prepare them for life. I think it's fair to say not all of our students are entirely ready for university when they come to us. And one of the things that we work with them is to make them ready and to make them prepared to succeed. But they are all of them ready for life when they leave. And if we're thinking about how to define something like learning gain, I think this has, has to be part of it. Our students are also very highly employable, and this is not only because they have been taught really well and really know their stuff, uh, but also because of our commitment to accompanying their subject education with something broader. So we've got a variety of, of, um, of programs that allow for the co-curricular experience to be really um, effective. Uh, under a, a kind of label called DMU Global, uh, Local, we have students who go out into commun community and work very directly with the local population in our Square Mile program. And this is really kind of outreach in many ways to back to their own community, going out and saying you, you can change, that it is possible to have positive outcomes. And we've extended this to India, Square Mile India, um, latest project there working with an ashram that is actually home um, to, to those with leprosy and those recovering from leprosy. Our architecture students have actually gone out to this ashram on our really practicing what you might call social architecture by finding ways for the living quarters of these, of these um, inhabitants to be better, not to be, for instance, regularly flooded during the monsoon season. And this is about really taking what they're learning and applying it in a very high level social context. We also send thousands of our students abroad under our DMU Global program. And what's really important about this is that we make sure that they can go by subsidizing this journey financially. So whether it's a nice say, short haul to Europe or a long haul to other parts of the world, uh, the students are subsidized to the tune of about two thirds of the cost of the, of, uh, the journey. So we want to try to make sure that nobody is disenfranchised by what we have to offer them just because of their, their, um, their own personal circumstances. And finally, uh, within our university learning, teaching, and assessment um, strategy, we have a real commitment to what we're calling co-creation. And really, this is an aspect of what Shakira was saying earlier about partnership, the partnership challenge, working closely with our students to make sure that the learning and the teaching they receive suits them, that it gives them what they want and what they need, and that we can have a very cooperative relationship between our staff and students across the board. So um, when we approached the, the TEF2 um, development, um, it was with this, this kind of spirit in mind. And what I've given you here is really just a kind of workflow so that you can see how the conversations proceeded over the course of, of the, uh, the preparation for our submission into TEF2. Um, you can see here that the, um, the, the project board had a very wide representation and it included the deputy president of the students' union who um, is our education officer. Um, there was a lot of back and forth in terms of workshops, focus groups, and the rest of it, gathering information from faculties, feeding it in, sending it back, feeding it in. But I'll draw your attention to the lower right, where you can see that our student representation was always there through attendance at the workshops and internal conferences, in terms of drafting and reviewing our statement and making sure that the student's voice was part of that, not merely in our students' union statements that was included as part of the provider statement, but throughout it. Um, that we held student focus groups about their teaching and learning experiences and made sure that that was part of the way in which we described ourselves. And we made sure the students understood what TEF actually was and why we wanted to do it and why we felt that it was really important for the institution. So um, I'm not gonna kind of go through this in detail, it's there for you to see, but it's just to give you um, a sense of insight into how we want to approach the kinds of things that we do with our students. And I think just to wrap up, this is because we feel very deeply at DMU that the most effective way 
to tell the story of what we do well is to tell it with our students. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now would you please welcome Lauren to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I've been asked this talk from the student perspective on teaching excellence. Um, I think it's very hard to give one definition of what teaching excellence is. It's different for everyone as we all learn and teach in different ways. So if anyone can come up with one sole definition that makes everyone happy, I will buy you a drink after the conference because it will just make our lives easier. <laughs> As a student, I think you can broadly say that excellent teaching has to be at least three key things. And I'm going to try and give a bit of an overview from my experiences as a student, as a sabbatical officer in writing a TEF submission, and as a TEF assessor. I think the first thing that excellent teaching needs to be is engaging. It needs to vary in style and capture the diverse student population and their needs. It needs to be delivered by people who are enthusiastic and passionate by someone who's passionate about both their subject and about teaching and sharing knowledge. It needs to involve personal experiences, capture research and be up to date, but also make you want to question and learn more. As we all know that learning doesn't end in the classroom and students should be inspired to take their knowledge further. I think excellent teaching also needs to be supportive. It needs to be full of feedback and dialogue on performance. It needs to be given by people who want you to succeed and work with you to succeed. And it needs to be in an environment which is caring and understanding of the complexities of student life. As we know, there are more to the, there's more to the student experience than just teaching, and all of the aspects of student life need to support each other. But how do you measure these things, and how do you know if they're even happening? And this is where the third thing comes in partnership, and we've all been talking about it all day. Whether I knew it or not as an undergraduate student, but I now know it after being a SAB and from my HE experience, I wanted partnership. I wanted teaching which cared about what I thought of it, took my experiences into account, and evolved and improved with the students at my institution. And I think that's the dream for all students. From being involved in a TEF submission from an institution as a sabbatical officer, I can see absolutely no negatives in fully involving your students' union and students in this process in as many ways as possible. This type of partnership, in my view, benefits everyone. Students are the ones who know if their teaching is excellent because of the relationship that they have with their staff on the ground every day. And this can uncover things that you might not have even thought of or been aware of that's happening at your institution. Your students' unions are the people who are running your teaching awards and they have a vast amount of information on teaching excellence from that. But wider students' unions know where the excellent teaching is because they talk to your students every day. It improves and helps with student engagement because it reinforces and demonstrates that students have a voice which is valued, which may have further benefits down the line. And also, students are getting involved with and learning about what's happening in the sector and how these big processes are affecting and involving students. The reason I applied to be a TEF assessor during TEF 2 was because it was clear that this was going to be a big change for HE and would have big impacts on students and on student choice. So the best way I saw to understand it the, and the full impact it had on the student voice and to have a voice in shaping its future was to be involved in the most direct way possible. And my experience has been invaluable. I've learned so much by being involved in as assessor about the process and its impact on students and took that back to my campus. And it's clear to see the different insights and aspects student assessors bring in understanding and relating to what it's like to be a student on our campuses and relating to what is said in provider submissions. It's also important for us students to feedback, to question and to have a role in improving the process as a key stakeholder. I know from being an assessor that student views are highly valued and from going through the lessons learned, this couldn't have been clearer. I think it's clear that in order to understand and properly measure what teaching excellence is, in all types of provider, students must be fully involved. If we are to properly inform student choice and have truly representative ways of assessing what teaching excellence is, students need to be involved. And they also need to have a key role in developing the processes and students need to take up these opportunities. 
we need to have confidence that, what we're, that when we're measuring teaching excellence, this means that students and the sector have been fully involved and own it. We and the Office for Students also need to begin questioning how teaching excellence will evolve and how we will continue to measure this and involve students in the future, as teaching excellence will always change with our students, with the sector and within the climate we're in. Thank you. Okay, um, you've been busy uh, submitting some questions, as you, I, I only I have seen, mm -hmm. so I'm going to put some to the panel. Um, they mostly pick up on the theme of the student voice, um, and one of the provocative <laughs> questions is, given that the uh, evidence from the National Student Survey is being uh, accorded less weight in the TEF going forward, are you confident the student voice is going to be heard and acknowledged through TEF as we go forward? Well, I'll kick off and, and, and just say that um, there is a balance of metrics. Uh, the metrics that there currently are across the course and the splits are joined by the supplementary metrics. There's a metricization here. One can talk about the way that um, the National Student Survey is weighted, but there is a fundamentally important part here of the written submission. This actually is a process of academic judgment, very much like, actually, the Research Excellence Framework in some of its elements. So the written submission, I think, is absolutely key here in terms of getting a deeper understanding of what co-creation of the student voice, student as partner, student engagement actually means. Uh, and, and I think, actually, that's just almost, in a way, it's in... It is an indicative, up to 15 pages summary of your institution. The most important thing is what you're actually doing with your students. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would agree. I mean, the NSS is only a small element of how you actually measure or record or listen to the student voice. And if that's the only way in which we listen to the student voice, then we would be entirely led by a metric which we're not all of us, I think, entirely convinced students or, or academics is entirely a reliable metric anyway. So I think it, it has to be that when you're putting together the, the statement, when you're actually telling that story, that's where you need to, to utilize and engage with the student voice. It's, it's even more important, I think, than a standalone metric. So the, you know, the NSS, who knows what they'll do with it next in terms of it as a metric, but that doesn't mean we lose the student voice. In fact, it makes it even more important that we actively engage with our students as we're doing the, the very important other part of TEF. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree. I think we need to be putting the onus onto the institutions who are writing this submission to knock on the door of their students' union and be like, do you want to be involved? Do you want to write a section of this submission? And also utilise the plethora of existing student feedback mechanisms that we have in institutions. Like we don't just have the NSS. There are institutions that are doing mid-module review, end-of-module review, have like a, a tell us now, like instant feedback mechanism and we need to make sure that institutions are, are aware that they can put all of this in the submission they can write whatever they want they don't have to write to the you know the areas that are outlined in the submission like it doesn't have to be confined to that you can tell us whatever you want to convince us that you are excellent so it, using anything you have okay and, th and this one's forward looking so this is beyond the teaching excellence framework if you had a wish list what would you like the OFS to be doing to be promoting excellent, to be promoting excellent teaching? I'm afraid we've got one quick answer each. I'll have a, a quick answer, which is um, one of the very important themes of, the, of this uh, launch has been around opportunity for all. I would really like us to think extremely deeply as a country and our education institutions what that actually means in terms of teaching and learning excellence for all. And I would say we need to make sure that we continue to have the dialogue. So not a reactive, we don't like it, but actually the dialogue that allows us to constructively create what we think teaching excellence really looks like. And I think the OFS needs to be in constant communication with their students and also having students at the heart, utilising NUS, utilising students' unions, all the existing networks, because the things already exist to talk to students and get their feedback and, and make sure that they really are at the heart of the OFS. That's a great line of accountability to the OFS to end on. Thank you very much.
and, and panel. Um, this is a really important theme. You heard it all the way through the student commentary. Teaching excellence is what they uh, insist on, whether at university level or uh, the big surveys. And uh, this work that we've just heard about in the last um, uh, half hour is really important to the future of the university sector uh, and the prospects for students in the future. So thank you very much to Yvonne uh, uh, and the panel. Thank you. Thank you again.